today, like every morning, you had a brief encounter with the subject of today's talk. And after... And after about a distance of 30 centimeters, where it appeared and quickly disappeared, what we don't even think about every day, has actually ranked number four as the greatest engineering challenge of the 20th century, right up there with electrification, water supply and distribution, and I should add sanitation. This is the reason why we have significant improvements of public health in the cities we live in today. Who would have guessed that washing hands would be that powerful? Unfortunately, what we take for granted is not available in many other places. And uh, for more than 35% of the world population, uh, this is not um, something they can rely on. Throughout the world, an estimate of 2.5 billion people suffer from a lack of sanitation, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa, in India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. So what does it take to provide safe water supply and sanitation. The approach many cities have taken actually dates back to the Roman Empire. Let's look at Munich as an example. We rely on water from pristine areas where water is abstracted and then conveyed into cities where it usually is used once. This water is then flushed and collected into sewer pipes. And these are connected to wastewater treatment plants. These pipes need to be flushed on a regular basis um, in order to flush the city waste to these wastewater treatment plants because you don't want that poop to uh, pile up in these pipelines. In these wastewater treatment plants, we're using a process we call the activated sludge process, which is about 100 years old. And after this treatment, this water is discharged to streams. There are four things um, that uh, are required for these systems to work. First of all, we need technology. Second, we need engineers that, uh, that can engineer and apply these te technologies. We also need people that take care of uh, water quality and compliance. And we need a financing system that pays and covers the cost to run these operations. And frequently, one of these elements are lacking in the countries I mentioned before, in Africa or in India. When we look at the attributes of these systems, they are pretty linear. We rely on pristine areas, we import water into cities, we use it once, we're discharging into streams. Unfortunately, and not all places are as lucky as Munich, where this water is simply running downhill into the city. In most places, water needs to be pumped over long distance and need to be treated, and this requires energy, frequently substantial amounts of energy. So what are the benefits of such a system. Um, they are pretty amazing. Regardless where you go in this country, you can always consume water from any faucet. Each of us consumes about 122 liters every day of clean water. And most of that clean water is actually used for showering, for toilet flushing, for gardening, for irrigation purposes, car washing and only a tiny amount, five liters, are actually used for drinking and cooking. So that's quite amazing. Drinking water to flush toilets and garden. That sounds like you use your brand new BMW to drive 20 chickens to the farmer's market. And certainly not approach that would work in many other places. When we use this water, then we turn this into wastewater. But what is in wastewater? Well. It turns out that in wastewater, while it looks dirty and it might stink, we still look at 99% water or H2O. And only a tiny bit is actually the waste, the stinky stuff. So let's blow up this cake uh, to look at this a little closer. Mainly we're looking at salts coming from cooking, nutrients, and organic matter, 0.1%. So when we think about this big pie, um, of water, maybe we could also think about opportunities to reuse, to recycle this water. 
and we might want to call it not wastewater because there seems to be not so much waste in this water, uh, but used water. There are also other reasons to reconsider how we deal with these water systems and water in general. Challenges that haven't been really that much at the forefront in the past when we designed these systems. Uh, one is the fact that our infrastructure is about 50 to 100 years old and it needs replacement and repair. There's also urbanization we're facing. More and more people live in cities. In 14 years, about 80% of people in Europe will live in cities. And there's impacts from climate change on water availability and water quality. Here's this graph from California, and you might have heard about this exceptional drought uh, that state experienced over the last couple of years. But we have experienced also similar stress from extended droughts last summer in northern Bavaria. Um, so that's not typical for maybe arid areas, even in our home state, we can see situations where we have climate change on our water supply already. So when we think about these challenges and how to overcome them, it might be worth to look at other sectors to, to see how these uh, changes have been manifested and they dealt with uh, these challenges. And I mentioned already this activated sludge process in wastewater treatment plants, 100 years old. It was actually invented in 1914. So that's about a 100 year time scale. And when we think of other technologies, like the car, that was a luxury item 100 years ago. Today, it's commonplace. Flying an airplane, risky undertaking. Nobody would dare. Today is a mass transport for many, many people. Some technologies didn't make it, like the gramophone. Who cares about that today, right? But in wastewater treatment, we still rely more or less on the same process, this activated sludge process. Of course, it has seen some optimization, but the core idea is still the same. So how do we address these challenges? Well, we can do more of the same, or you can reinvent. So here are some ideas we do at the Technical University to address these issues. Remember this pie chart I showed you earlier on this used water and this red portion is the stinky stuff, the organic matter? Well, this red portion uh, contains more energy than you need to treat this used water, about 1.7 kilowatt hours per cubic meter, and it's captured in the organic matter. So we can develop and optimize technologies and processes to recover this energy. And we're doing it by implementing digesters where this water is treated with microorganisms. You form biomass and this biomass is transferred into these digesters and converted into methane gas, biogas. So we can harvest gas, we can convert this into electricity in heat or biofuels. And in theory, not just in theory, we can run these plants energy neutral or energy positive more energy than you actually need to treat it. And therefore, what we really do, we recognize uh, that this is not a waste product, but it is an opportunity for resource recovery. We can also let Mother Nature work for us. In 2001, a paper was published that uh, demonstrated the human genome, about 90% of three billion base pairs were sequenced. That took about 10 years to accomplish by an international consortium of researchers. Today, the technology we have, we can do the same thing in three months. So this advancement in genomics also has made a major change in the field of environmental engineering. We can utilize these techniques and understand the structure of and function of every single microbe in biological treatment systems. So a complete new opportunity to design and uh, operate these systems. And here's one example of a process we developed here at Munich. We call it the SMART process, Sequential Managed Aquifer Recharge Technology. And what it is is rather simple, but it uh, essentially modified the operating condition in a way that we select for more powerful bacteria that can remove contaminants more effectively. Here's some results. So in gray is the conventional system, and in blue is a system that uh, represents a smart process. Much better removal. Why is this important? Well, if you can remove this faster and more efficiently, we can also shrink the footprint. 
and this is a low carbon technology that could also be deployed in developing countries. So a lot of opportunities um, to utilize new tools that haven't been available uh, in the past. What about the supply and the treatment in cities uh, today? I mentioned that usually you have centralized treatment facilities. There might be one source of supply. Why not thinking about more decentralized uh, systems that utilize multiple forms of supply of water for cities, but also multiple decentralized treatment systems? These are approaches that are commonly employed in other places, um, such as Australia. So here's a rainwater tank, which is required by law to be implemented for every single house. So every homeowner is required to put in a rainwater tank, and this water is used for irrigation, gardening, and toilet flushing. When we look at these centralized systems, these little blue dots represent maybe houses or little neighborhoods. Uh, they're all connected to a centralized sewer line which ends up in a wastewater treatment plant. That's how we do business today. But what about if you cut this all into smaller pieces and you have individual plants? Well, the conventional engineer of today would argue, well, way too expensive. That's 10 times more expensive to treat a cubic meter of water than do it in a centralized fashion. The reason is the energy demand. But they're not looking and considering the opportunities you have by utilizing this water in a decentralized local fashion. You don't need to pump this water from your centralized si uh, system back into the city. You can use it where you generate it. And you can tailor the quality to the needs uh, to utilize this water for different purposes. So a lot of opportunities exist. How do we might configure these systems. Um, well, certainly a decentralized system is not the solution for every place, but we can imagine that in certain settings this might be offering a better solution. And here's an example. So imagine a neighborhood. The water is generated locally and it's collected and it's routed into a treatment facility. And these facilities might have the size of a single car garage. Very compact. You wouldn't notice when you pass by. Um, but this water can be treated to different qualities. You can use it for toilet flushing, for gardening, where you don't need drinking water quality, or you have a second separate treatment system that elevates this quality to drinking water purposes with a small amount of water that actually requires drinking water quality. So in the city of the future, uh, water will flow in cycles. We try to maintain and keep this water in the city to augment supplies locally. And we integrate energy recovery and heat recovery. This energy and heat is returned to the city and that's how we would envision how water is managed in cities of the future. Thank you.